In a recent IPSA seminar, Steve walked the students through a 20-page historical document from the year 2000, detailing the nature of complexes and how to deal with them. Steve and Pauline would give this document both to trainee therapists and also to patients for them to understand what they were dealing with clinically. We're making this available to Young to Live By viewers in the hope that it can be useful to you too, either for personal development or for aiding in your own clinical practice. Let's go. But even here, you can see back in 2000, the emphasis was on instincts and not archetypes because we knew, we absolutely knew that that was a decisive thing. Um, and as you can see here, the problems of conscious adaptation. That by the time the instinct gets to the complex, it's oh shit because we're so removed from that foundational need to connect deep down. Yeah, there's about 20 pages worth of this stuff. Yeah, if, if, if you can bear with it, guys, it, it might be some uh, amusements. But can I go back at uh, that one? Yeah, previous of days, yeah. <clears throat> so you can see how we're relating the idea of an amargo here to the nucleus of a complex and connections between them, and the shaded area around the rim being basically a kind of a coat of affect, which uh, negative effect, which can protect the elements of the complex from analysis. Uh, that's typically how you find them, that there's some kind of image is present. Uh, that relates to something which they are unconscious of, uh, but is never less operant within them. But when you start to follow the lines of association you, towards the nucleus, you inevitably bang up against the defence, which is usually an emotion. Yeah, this is like the, the uh, to try to illustrate the defence mechanism. As it says here, in-depth psychotherapy, the analyst needs to see both the suffering of the patient and the true nature of the problem that lies behind it. It's thought by some schools that the conscious ego personality protects itself from anxiety by a variety of defense mechanisms. This was Freud's insight, Freud and Josef Breuer. What we do is we're following uh, Jung's pioneering work. The ability of complexes to defend themselves is recognized. Usually the conscious mind only experiences the complex's defense rather than the actual complex itself. And it's most often as a powerful negative emotion or sensation of emotion, it, it might be better conceived of now as being a state of arousal rather than an emotion as such. Because uh, anxiety is not an emotion, anxiety is an arousal state. So analysis must aim at identifying the core ideas that make up the complex and that excrete the negative arousal state, I'll, I'll call it now, which defends it. Okay, James, if there's no questions on that, can we move on? Yeah, forgive me on this one, but this is basically your ego identified complex and what it's like. Basically, you know, the uh, ego identified complex asserts that it is the ego and the ego agrees with that. And that's a done deal. At that point, there is no separation or, or distinction. You'll recognize this kind of thing from uh, the personal myth guide where I think we've done a, a bit of a better job. But this was back in the day. No, this I mean, is this is classic art, Steve. I really enjoy this. <laughs> it's more like a meme, isn't it? <laughs> But the, the explanation stands if, if we, we update the model, bearing in mind after 21 years, I think we can say it's okay to have updated the model and moved on a bit. Yes. Uh, I will say if, if this was a complex, I'd love to have that complex. <laughs> yeah, he looks like a scientist, doesn't he? he? He does. He does. Always very happy. Yeah, he's got a lab coat on. He's got a lab coat on, yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah, so the idea of inhibition and excitation with a neural model uh, uh, insofar as complexes must have a neural representation as well so that there will be a network as such and how they can either excite or inhibit one another um, and the complexes form systems of complexes that can sometimes um, activate independently of the others but then form an unholy alliance and act together so it's just a way of uh, describing what that might be. But you can say ego or alter ego at the bottom. Uh, so all, all these basic structures were in place then. 
this is, I think, fairly familiar because there's, there's a version of this in the personal myth guide, which just basically shows what uh, different complexes are in relation to the ego and the field of consciousness. Yeah, please ex excuse the sentiment spoken by that thing in the tank. That, that, that's a common expression used in the UK <laughs> when I was young. And it just means generally to anybody, you know, rather than Americans. So uh, apologies for that. I wouldn't even know what it means at all, even in reference to Americans. Well, that's because you're too young, James. You didn't, oh, yeah. you didn't, you didn't <laughs> exist until the end of the 20th century. Oh. I, I did in a morphogenic field. Well, I, I suppose that's true. I suppose that's true. Well, ask your unconscious. Use the morphogenic field and tell us what it means, James. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, complexes can... Uh, bring a designer attack uh, towards the ego because it will complexes are aware like a virus will be of what the defense mechanism of the ego is and to some extent how to bypass it that they are intelligent within a, a narrow <coughs> range which is it's the range at which it was formed the conditions within which a complex forms determines what it can do what it has access to with respect to memories associations how much of the self-concept it might be invested in that kind of thing so when we say they're intelligent within a narrow range and then they adapt perfectly to the psychological environment within which they exist and can even hijack a person's beliefs for use against them. As a rule, people, thank you, James, as a rule, people have no defense against their own way of making sense of the world. That's really important. So hence, you know, a thinking type, for example, introverted thinking type who lives and therefore metaphorically dies by that function if a complex can get inside that dominant function, there will be little or no automatic psychological immune response to it. It's acted like HIV in the sense that it's an acquired immune issue that the complex has simply just stepped in and said, well, I'll have that, thank you, and you won't even know I'm here. And that's been ex explicated further in the personal myth guide to extend that to the alter ego and to the negative animal as a whole. So if a complex can coat itself in these ideas, then the ego will accept whatever the complex says. This is <clears throat> true for psychological theories as well. If a Freudian analyst has a complex that utilizes weaknesses identified by Freudian theory, then she or he will have little or no defense against it. It will take uncritically. And again, this is another reason to be very careful about Jungian ideas because they will make people vulnerable to a specific approach from complexes. They'll just, just take on, I'm your shadow, guess what? You know, you, you, you need to integrate me. Isn't that what they say? And, oh, oh, yeah, fine, come in. I'll open the door to my ego, and in you come. No resistance, close the door. And guess what? All these idiots on the internet are saying, do the same thing, so it must be true. Which is what she, we have her saying, all this fits. I must have that problem. Everything I believe in, everything I believe in proves it. I have created a Jungian shadow complex through suggestion. And all that's happened is that something which is unpleasant has decided to coat itself in that appearance. And I have no defense against this. That's how it works in a very simple way. Yeah, the relationship between a polarized ego shadow system. And this is unfortunately how Jungians tend to see it anyway. They, they, they tend to see it in that way that uh, the ego is Mr. Nice Guy and therefore the shadow is huge and bigger uh, and problematical. It's true in extreme senses uh, or in, as I was just been saying now, if you acquire a belief in the form of a complex and therefore generate the impression that this huge shadow exists and that you're too nice and one-sided, what happens then is that that belief will be utilized to attack from within, correlated with suggestion from without. So you basically create something that was never there. And that's something I tried to, to say on the forum, sorry, the Discord actually yesterday, uh, to someone uh, about the shadow. No, was it YouTube? Uh, one of the other, anyway, I think I, I, think I put it up. Was if it, yes, it was YouTube. That this person seemed almost determined to have a Jungian shadow problem. Well, he's just created it through that belief. The truth could be something completely different, but it will appear that way to the ego because he's primed himself to believe it, therefore he will become vulnerable and have no defense. Uh, but in a classical sense, that's what the Jungians believe in, and that's what they look for. So they miss homeostasis. They just, they just look for the polarity and the antagonism between the polarity rather than an operational bandwidth for tolerances that allow you to function in an everyday sense. 
This is a, a pretty common thing, really, and uh, a lot of people used to, when, when I use this, this metaphor a lot, find this helpful that in self-defense, so to speak, complexes will literally excrete emotion, more likely in arousal state, uh, like a skunk, in order to ward off attempts by the ego or a therapist to deconstruct the complex. So you'll see an increase in arousal. Uh, for example, the, the obvious case is OCD. If you, if you try and help somebody to stop thinking in a certain way that they have ritualized, the thoughts go up to push you away. Or more likely, if you're actually getting inside that structure, the anxiety level will just go up massively. From a background 70% that most of these, these poor sufferers are in to nearly 100% of absolute terror because you're, you're contradicting the thing that wants to live and therefore it excretes this arousal state to, to keep you away. So this is the first indication uh, the ego has that the complex is under threat, actually, when you can turn that around. An increase in defensive affect at this point may uh, many give up because of the strength of the unpleasant feeling tone. This is, of course, what the complex would intend in order to maintain its own functional survival. But it gives you an indication if the arousal goes up, not that you should go away, but you've had a signal. And the signal is that you're onto something. So then you have to settle down to finding a way around that and to bypass it rather than to take it on head on. Again, we have another example of it. Complexes, in, in essence, have a kind of a rhetoric, which is uh, a pattern that cognitive therapists identify as being negative automatic thoughts, that kind of thing. They get that far. And it's... When it's active, it's experienced consciously as that set of thoughts, ideas, and associations, which the ego, of course, believes in. So under pressure, complexes will generate multiple ideas that feed back onto one another in order to trap the ego into not being able to think with discrimination. There will always be a but, for example, and or two alternatives, neither of which do anything other than support the complex. That's how you know that people are trapped in this, this uh, logic loop. And again, unfortunately, educated people, over-educated young people uh, who uh, are into philosophy fall into this trap all the time. Their way of making sense of the world becomes a way of making nonsense of the world. And that's exactly what is required to maintain the integrity of a complex. So it'll just, yeah, I'll have a bit of that and give that back to you and you won't have any defense and we'll stay trapped forever. So attempts at getting past these ideas generate unpleasant affect re reactions. The ideas often mask the real core ideas, as for example, may be found in OCD. Analysts need to be able to see the dynamics at work and safely bypass the complex's defensive rhetoric. This is where um, projective techniques like the sound tray come in because it's not verbal, it's a thing. And you're asking the unconscious to bypass the ego's distress and preoccupation with itself in that negative feedback loop. You're getting past the complexes associated with the ego, that is to say aligned or identified with by just jumping around them. So Sancho is useful in generating an opposition to this thing, governing the, the normal personality's uh, control or, and reflexivity of itself, to put that into context. <coughs> Thank you, James. Here's an example of the negative anima complex. There's the, the inner demon that gets uh, gets created by belief that it is an inner demon. The, 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 this this is, could be the example of someone exposed to Jungian ideas again. And then it projects the imago, the image, as you saw earlier on, of the complex, which sums up what the complex is in consciousness and is then related to and reinforced, it then gets projected onto some poor house of woman, and it's you, you've done this to me, you're the problem, you're the witch. And really it's, it's a case of poor relating internally, and then the dictum that what is within, so too is without, this time through projection or transference, and some poor innocent person outside cops for it. So it's a graphic way of showing how that emerges. Okay, James? What you, you get sometimes is uh, a complex, and this again is a viral analogy where it, it adopts the appearance of something else. And uh, you, you, an example of this is when you are in conversation with someone, say therapeutically, and the conversation, the dialectic is going well, 
and then suddenly something's inserted. Now, you know about this. You, you've seen this. You, we, we've discussed it before. Something is inserted in the middle of the conversation at a special articulation point that shows that something else is hiding in there and is trying to slip in, disguised. And the kind of uh, moments that, that it typically it will it will do this is at the end of something being said, and then as you by them by the person, and then as you start to say something, it's on that crossover point, and it's a negative, it's a, a nullification of everything positive that you've been working with that person with, and they might say, "Don't you think?" or "Do you agree?" and you're doing this as it, he then adds something that's negative. And he may only whisper it, but what you've done is confirm it. So it slipped by not only his defense mechanism, his psychological immunity, but also your own observation. So you need to be sharp about that. So the, the metaphor or the analogy, if you like, is uh, a Trojan horse. The analyst's uh, role here is to help the patient to develop their powers of discrimination, thereby being able to separate the complex off from its disguise, thus preventing the creation of a negative identified complex. Because in effect, you, you, you're working there with confirmation bias. The complex wants you to confirm it. Because then the ego will just make it stronger and maybe, maybe even move a weak association to a complex into a, an identified state. And you've been forced to do it because of the way that the game has been played how it's turned up so in practical psychotherapy such disguised complexes are common and difficult to deal with they often work within dreams once the patient has begun to work with them and to take them seriously in an intelligent utilization uh, technique by the complex that's what it is it utilizes the the way dreams are interpreted and that's why i made the post today on discords so that guy was talking about a dream uh, and how careful you have to be about jumping to conclusions before you've built up rapport with the psyche or indicated to the healthier part of the of the mind of the person concerned that you acknowledge the distress, you acknowledge the presence and activity of complexes, you acknowledge that they were set up originally to protect the person from something. So you're not attacking them, certainly not directly, but you're interested in that deeper part that is not verbal, that is not linguistic, that is not whatever, but will come through if it's allowed to have the opportunity to express itself. That kind of approach tends to sidestep the problems I'm discussing here, which are the problems generated by things like CBT, because their approach is completely wrong, the way that they deal with these things. So basically you have the mesmerized ego, and this is uh, forgive me, Janet, I'm not, if you're here, I'm not making any suggestions about you, but this is the, the fascination we can have with something that emerges from within that is overpowering in its emotion. It's only a complex if it's actually something else that, that, that's, that's disguising itself. I'm not suggesting that's the case with you at all. But another way that this can work is that we, we become fascinated with the apperception internally of that which is emerging. But that which is emerging is seeking fulfillment in the outer world by adaptation and if we only focus on the image in the form of an affect we're, we're not acting it out so uh, that which generates this focused attention which eventually can become a fascination and therefore mesmerism internally is really to, to not do that but, but to act out in the world now in a pathological sense that works with complexes and this is an example of how that happens and the ego says oh it seems harmless what have I got to worry about? Well, it turns out everything in this case, because the thing is operant in your speech, in your patterns, in your thinking, and it embeds itself in as if woven into a tapestry. So the mesmerized I go inward uh, looking, but failing to see through the complex's deception. Many complexes approach the ego by stealth, not directly revealing themselves or their true intentions. They function like a good hypnotist in that they attach so, yeah, they attach their negative ideas to something else that seems to the ego quite reasonable and harmless. In other words, they pace the ego and then lead it. This way, the complex bypasses the ego's natural psychological immunity, like viruses. Once inside the ego, they will attempt to force it to reproduce the complex's ideation, thoughts, feelings, etc. This is the basic etiology of identified complexes. Once they're in, they will make the ego replicate its thoughts, its feelings, its interpretations, its associations. 
and then we'll acquire confirmation bias from others, including the culture, therapists, friends, family, anyone it can get to listen to it. Because it's a parasite, it can't exist without being fed. Therefore, it requires the ego's libido to be a resource for it. So it must be active continuously. It's not natural. If the complex's defenses go down, the psychological immunity will eventually catch up with it and will destroy it, will metabolize, catabolize, excrete it out from the ego, break it down. So it's got to keep the ego distracted all the time. That's something that could happen in reverse too, Steve, isn't it really? In any kind of psychotherapeutic engagement, you know, the, yes. the therapist, for whatever reason, might end up in that state too. Oh, if, they, sure. if they become mesmerized by you know, the content or, or the, the patient's complex in some way, if, if it finds a, a gap or a way in to their psychology, then they can end up in that state too. Yes, you, you get a, sh you get a yes, shared delusion. You do, yeah. Which is mm. a, a problem, you know, it's a real problem. And this is why our own belief systems are important and just how much we can justify them objectively outside of ourselves before we bring ideas and influences into another person's life. Because there might be a correlation between some part, some content yeah. that, that we just accept and believe in. And I'll say bordering on woo-woo, for example, mm. that will match something inside that person, which could be of a psychotic intensity, for example. Uh, and Jungians, they do this kind of thing all the time, which is another reason why their therapy takes forever, because... They start the process by damaging the person they're trying to help. They further dissociate them, further break them down, and then introduce inflationary ideas. And then say it's all transference and it's going to take years to sort this out. Tell me about your dreams. Well, if you tell someone to focus on their dreams and they're vulnerable, they probably will. But all that will do is, is create another shared fantasy that sustains the status quo status quo in the uh, in the patients and also sustains the shared delusion that they're actually doing something through the analytical process once it's extended out so yeah that, that that's that's an example and we have to be careful what we communicate to people always look for the healthy part of them that wants to get quick quickly well in an evolutionary sense slow change is not a good thing you get deleted from the gene pool if you adapt slowly yeah. so the genome wants you to adapt flexibly that's why we have a conscious mind the purpose of therapy is to engage the conscious mind with the unconscious to join the dots and successfully adapt not to spend years of your life wasting your time with utter nonsense so we have to be careful about how we do this kind of work Okay, thanks, James. Well, we're on to dreams now. So, again, this needs some revision. Jung said the complexes are the architects of dreams. This means they provide the blueprint for the narrative structure of most dreams. Well, that part of it might still be relatively accurate, bearing in mind what's been discovered over recent decades. But it seems now the complexes aren't the architects of dreams, but they're the hired actors, if you like. Uh, in the sense that the self-regulating part of the psyche and the instincts and gene expression are all involved in producing a play, if you like, within which the complexes are drawn to illustrate in order for the dream ego to begin to relate to complexes properly in a way that can be communicated to the conscious ego to change behaviour in the outer world. Completely different way of looking at it. It's simpler, more elegant, more accurate, more likely to succeed. The problem with the traditional analytical view that um, complexes are the architects of dreams is that you overvalue complexes and their autonomy. They produce the dreams. Therefore, they are very, very important. And what happens then as you go towards the concept of a complex, you're drawn into the further, deeper, wider, more mesmerizing concept of an archetype. And before you know it, you're in fairy land and you're not dealing with the realities of why the brain is set up to work the way it is and why instincts work the way that they do and why affect works the way that it does. As we, I think we said last week, uh, affect is at the core uh, of complexes insofar as it is primordial consciousness and it gives meaning to the otherwise dissociated ideas and associations which are flattened out into memory without autonomy, unless it's connected to meaning, which is provided by instinct and emotion. So therefore, affect and instinct are at the core 
uh, of complexes and also are at the core of dreams. Mark Solms' work verifies this. I believe Eric Goodwin's, some of Eric Goodwin's work too suggests that this is the case. I know he's divergence in other senses, but the, the, the idea um, that I've read in some of the neurobiology of the gods, some of those ideas support that would cross over with Mark Solms' work and would support the ideas that I'm putting forward here. Interesting that you've chosen an instinctive image as yeah. opposed to yes. like Palio the wise old man or some, yeah, something like that. Yes, it is, isn't it? The symbolic yeah. dream image in that sense yeah. would be compensating for the idea, the theory that we may acquire from the culture or from influential individuals in our lives to say that, oh no, complexes and architects, architects are the architects of our dreams where actual fact it's more paleolithic, it's yeah. more instinctive yeah. and it's about adaptation. <laughs> Meta-analysis of uh, dream symbols suggests that at least half mm. are instinctive and have nothing to do with complexes at all. That is to say, acquired experiences. So that, that's important. So some dreams derive from instinctive or archetypal sources, but most will be found to have their origin in one or more complexes. Now remember, this is old, this is 21 years old, and I've just revised that perspective. Of course, many complexes are positive in nature, others ambivalent. A given dream may be distilled from many complexes, which fits in with the idea I've said that they are basically hired actors drawn into a narrative by the homeostasis of the psyche to allow the dream ego to relate to those complexes rather than the complexes themselves being the architects. They're drawn in, given an opportunity to reflect themselves to consciousness in, in the dream ego state. That's how I see it now, and I think it works far better mm -hmm. than this approach in this particular slide, which is closer to uh, Jung's original ideas. Complexes, each of which may carry opposing or opposite charges, positive, negative, neutral, ambivalence, etc., relative to the ego. Yeah. The analysis of dreams is with word association protocols, that still stands, and careful analysis of language patterning still stands, including parapraxis, the Freudian slip a primary source for assessing an individual's complexes. Other sources include behavioral disturbances, that's psychosocial, psychophysiological symptoms, fixed ideas, the mesmerism that I was mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. Dreams are relatively uncontaminated by the ego, according to uh, Jung. I think that is true because the ego is brought into a proxy experience of dreams in the form or the guise of the dream ego, they're, they're different, but they're connected by the self-concept, if you remember. That's the thing that, that moves across. So the self-concept is the sense of continuity, is the through line. The self-concept is that, is the through line. That's who you think and feel you are when you re relate to your inner self and the, the continuity of identity that you have as the self-concept. And that's what complexes love to play. Um, psychophysical symptoms, fixed ideas and so on. Dreams are relatively uncontaminated, yeah. If addressed honestly and openly by the patient, yes, that's what we need to do. There's usually much more resistance with the, uh, with the other symbolic forms of, of complex manifestation. In other words, the dream is just it. It is the attempt at self-regulation. Whereas if you try to work in a different way with complexes, say didactically, consciously, interactively, you get more fluff because you're not being directly regulated by the brain and almost certainly by the genome through gene, ex uh, gene expression. Uh, it's, a, it's a different level of focus on an organization. So that's why dreams are useful. That, that bit still stands. Thanks, James. So they hide in the dark of the unconscious and basically the ego then experiences the idea that they don't know why they're feeling a certain way. That's because the complex itself is hiding in an area which cannot be associated to or discriminated from. Now, the value of this is the vampire metaphor. Like vampires, complexes have no authentic life of their own. They need a victim <laughs> of which to feed. Again, like van vampires, they avoid the light, metaphorically the light of consciousness. In the, the struggle with their complexes, the person often feels themselves becoming exhausted, depressed, and or anxious. It is as if the complex were draining them of their energy, literally their libido. This is often seen as psychiatric or psychological symptomology. Metaphorically, the complex is drawing energy away from the ego in order to satiate itself. As they have no energy of their own, 
in uncomplicated cases. By uncomplicated, I mean, for example, where there is a true ego identity to the extent where they are investing, or the ego is investing its energy into the complex, and it's a shared, if you like, um, almost codependent relationship. That kind of thing can happen, but it's usually better not to suggest that to somebody because that will only reinforce the identification that you're trying to deal with. The energy battle becomes a moral issue, one of dominance and control over consciousness. Like any living thing, complexes will fight for their own survival. Paradoxically, symptoms can re reveal distress um, in the complex. So the symptom of the complex can reveal distress by requiring the ego to feel something unpleasant or to go into a state of arousal. This occurs because it shares the ego's broader psychology and the person's physiology, think Rossi, state dependency. As a sufferer, it is difficult to distinguish between your own distress and that of the complex, which shares access to and representation within the limbic system and related psychophysiological systems. It is that serious. It's in your body. It roots itself down. It roots itself in your relationships. It roots itself in your psychology. How the hell do you separate something from, you know, this is how a person feels when they first receive the suggestion that the complex is not them. And the metaphor is the vampire that lives in the dark of the unconscious, feeds off you like a parasite, but it can have no life or sustenance on its own merit. It requires you to feed it willingly or unwillingly. And the idea is that we, we start to break down that relationship, that parasitical relationship, but you will feel some distress unless we can buffer them from that. And that's when we use techniques like hypnosis. Thanks, James. The acid test, realizing the complex's ideation and rhetoric <laughs> is harmful. So when somebody can finally say, listening to all that crap isn't actually doing me any good, they can begin to the process of disidentification. That's the enlightened ego. That's the beginning of the end of the complex. It's the first stage of letting go of the complex's influence, realizing that however cleverly disguised or covertly presented, the complex's ideas are not good for your health. Thanks, James. <clears throat> However, there are defensive uh, attempts at de uh, demoralization when stood up to by, by the ego. This is where it starts to infer things such as you're not out of the woods yet. You're still lost. You'll never beat me. I'll always be here. This is Rumpelstiltskin in the fairy tale. You can't guess my name. And until you do, until you know who I really am, until you can identify me as not being you, I will have power over you. That's the implication. So complexes are adept at suggesting that things are too difficult to change or that they will never go away. All the ego's efforts, it will insinuate, will lead nowhere, perhaps even to the, or even that the effort is too much, much better to stay with things as, as they were, familiar and safe, even though someone is in a distressed state. This pressure can be so compelling that many will give up. Therapists too can be persuaded by the complex to give up on their patients by proxy through the patient's own ruminations and fears. We, we, in other words, we believe them. We believe that they can't win, they don't want to win, and we just back away from helping. It's just too much, I can't be bothered. A counter-transference might be an example of that. If this is successful, then the complex is won. In the end, health cannot be authentically achieved by the intervention of a therapist alone. It takes a personal victory by the person over themselves. The image of being lost and alone on a dark wood will be familiar to anyone who has reached this decisive stage of self-confrontation. And that's when you can't really leave them alone, but you can't rob them of the victory. I think, it, was it last week, James, we were talking about mentors, or was that on uh, Card of Two or Three? Ooh, uh, I could have sworn it was the week before that, actually. But was yeah, okay. Card of Two or Three session, for sure. But that's the, I'll call it, archetypal, psychocultural archetypal role of a mentor is to be present, but not to take away the victory. If we take away the victory, then you've gifted them a transference cure, which will rescind itself in time because it's reliant upon your intervention. 
and not on the person's growth. <coughs> Jungians would agree with that, in theory. <coughs> Thanks, James. Yeah, the fallacy of polyamorous positive thinking. You have a, a polarity between what is um, deemed to be negative and what is deemed to be positive, and that they're in conflict with one another. And then, according to, say, CBT, the ego has to make the decision that it comes down on the side of positive thinking. But mostly people in that trap don't know what to do because they cannot make the distinction. They're both true, apparently, sometimes. There's enough uh, support and experience in their environment to say that, well, I'm being negative about something, it might be true. So so-called positive thinking and positive affirmations are popular techniques in psychotherapy and self-help systems. With an aligned ego, sorry, an adaptive ego, such methods can be uh, can help to maintain health. In other words, if, you, if you're okay, then that's fair enough. You can self-regulate through your psychological immunity. But in situations where the ego is overwhelmed by life's demands, then the natural polarity of consciousness, that is the tendency to see opposites, which normally allows us to consider pros and cons in a situation can work against us and produce an unbearable tension. In some cognitive style therapies, the blame for this failure is usually located squarely with the patient. However, it is a product of the technique itself, the idea that polarities are both real and they must be dealt with in the sense that one must cancel out the other. Uh, every attempt at positive thinking in an overwhelmed ego merely produces its immediate equal and opposite force. This suits the survival of complexes that thrive on conflict as a medium within which to siphon off energy from ego consciousness. Thanks, James. Complex filtration process. Well, the complex will sit between you as in a projected space between you and your patients and will effectively say nothing gets past me wherever you say to the patients i will filter and distort and whatever he says to you i will fill or wants to say i will filter and distort and the patient is left thinking what the heck i don't understand i don't understand what you're saying i don't understand i can't feel it i'm in the state of distress and that's because there is an active filter that literally sits between you uh, and it's almost like a, a palpable presence they actively filter and distort communications between people, even in therapy, in order to protect their status or status and continued survival. And when active, such a filtration process can result in completely mishearing something or the patient being closed down as in a momentary loss of consciousness. You see this and people will often say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I drifted off. I, I can't hear what's going on. That's an active psychodynamic in the moment. Thanks, James. Nearly there, guys. The resolution of opposites in, in a Jungian sense, then, is the resolution of tension in a dynamic polarity. That's between positive and negative poles of uh, a complex's ideation, as in the previous uh, slide. Co uh, this is achieved dialectically by the creation of a third or transcendent position that's not merely the sum of the polarised pair, but rather something different, <coughs> which both contains and transcends the initial polarity. This can nullify a complex both by a negation of its polarised tension, which is necessary for it to maintain conflict, there has to be polarity, and by the negation of the negation, which in dialectics means the affirmation of the positive, but not in a simplistic Pollyanna way, but through a transcendent state, the third position. This is what Jungians aim for. This is why they feel they are different to cognitive therapists, so too mechanistic and superficial. This is a great idea, but it doesn't always work. It doesn't always work because it is still mechanistic and it's looking for something which will emerge from the oppositionality directly. And where Milton Erickson comes in is that he would bypass this completely and simply go to another part of the psyche, which itself will generate the synthesis without the necessity for the collision between the polarities in the first place. It, it's a nice move completely around it. And using creative media, you can do that too. The, the sand tray that we mentioned can just sort this out within the space of time it takes to create and then interpret the sand picture. You don't have to sweat something out horribly and confront yourself and hope that something emerges and that there's some dignity in going through that process of suffering. It's unnecessary sometimes, 
So night move thinking using hypnosis or using a projective creative media uh, such as the sound trade can achieve this much more quickly. Thanks, James. Just, just to say, Jamie, I see you put your hand up, mate. We're just going to take questions after this, uh, this next slide that's just shown. This is the last one, is it, James? Uh, this is 21 of 21. So that's 20, including the cover sheet. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Ego Identified Guild Complex. There's been a lot of talk about this, actually, on Discord recently and, and uh, with people that we've been working with. But basically, you, you when you have an identified guild complex, it basically persuades the ego that they're guilty, and then the ego just agrees with it because uh, it identifies with the guilt complex, and in effect, yeah, have a, let's have a laugh at the ego because it's it's accepted that line, swallowed it, great, right right in the middle. But the idea of illegitimate guilt over legitimate guilt, they're different things. Legitimate guilt can be solved. There are so many cultural. Uh, methods of doing this whether it just comes from uh, confession to apology to a legal redress whatever it might be these are all authentic ways of dealing with real guilt but none of them satisfy illegitimate guilt because it never was legitimate therefore it never was guilt it was something masquerading as guilt hence the idea of the trojan horse earlier on that would be an example of an illegitimate guilt complex that is disguised as something which you should be able to sort out but when you try it it doesn't work but because you don't know it isn't what it appears to be, it's as if you can't make the connection and you can't deal with it. Your immune system can't recognize it. It can't bind to the complex and defeat it. It's like, what the heck is going on? I, I can't solve this. So that's just an illustration from that because guilt complexes are so common. It's something that uh, we deal with all the time. Well, the, 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 well, the, some of the old um, diagrams that we used to use, they're dated 20 years ago, but they're actually older than that, 21 years ago. Okay, I'll just pause and have a sip if you don't mind before I uh, uh, take questions. Mm. Yeah, it's really cool to show the through line of the model, to be honest. How it is, it's, yeah, the things evolve, don't they? Yeah. Things evolve. If you're looking to take your study of depth psychology and personal development to the next level using Steve and Pauline's 40 year long clinical experience as your personal guide, then make sure you check out Young to Live By's flagship offering, Discover Your Personal Myth Ultimate Handbook. For anyone who has a calling deep in their very genome to become who they truly feel they should be, this guide is utterly indispensable. Pick up your copy today and make 2021 the year you truly begin to become yourself.